changes and the burden of this journey falls mostly on settler Canadians to understand the wrongs that were done and why we are committed to setting things right. It won't be overnight, but it starts with really understanding Section 35 of our Constitution. It starts with recognizing UNDRIP. It starts with passing uh, into law the bill that was stalled in the Senate. We have a lot of things we want to say about what we stand for as Greens. Fundamentally, what we stand for is rescuing our democracy and our parliament from corporate influence and corporate control, by rescuing our democracy and our parliament from the constant interventions of backroom political spin doctors and staffers who in the short time of my life in which I've worked in Ottawa, I, start, I did work in government in the 1980s, and that parliament was not dominated by spin doctors from back rooms telling the prime minister, this is a good law to pass because you can use this as a wedge issue in the next election. Wedge issues and dog whistle politics are contaminating parliament itself. We are committed to making our parliament more respectful, more effective, delivering for Canadians what they really want. And I believe what Canadians really want is peace, order, and green government. Thank you very much. By the way, you'll notice some of us are wearing this little circular rainbow pin. And it's very clear from the opening of the platform, you'll see why. Uh, we're the only party in Canada that recognizes that Canada's commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals is a commitment that our government took on. It's not just to say that we do all these things by 2030 in terms of our international development assistance. These goals, access to clean drinking water, ending poverty, ensuring that no one is hungry. These sustainable development goals are central to our platform, and that's why you'll see the icons for each UN sustainable development goal aligned with the platform promise. The United Nations is aiming at sustainable development through so these goals by 2030. Because that's the top of the box, 2030. That's where we're going on climate action, 2030. That's when we deliver on ending poverty in Canada and around the world by 2030. It's an exciting time to be alive because we actually can do all these things, but not with business as usual. So I open the floor to questions, but I have to say to all wonderful volunteers who are here, it's only the accredited media that can ask questions today, so I open the floor to anyone who wants to ask a question. Yes. There are some commitments in here that are going to be very expensive. Pharmacare, mm -hmm. dental care, eliminating poverty. The green plan is going to be expensive and you don't have the costings. Yes, it will be balanced in five years. And again, I'm sorry that we don't have our costing today. That is nobody's particular fault. And I want to insist on the fact that uh, we have tremendous appreciation for the parliamentary budget office for its work. It's only a question of a few days. But our platform is not expensive, and we have to do it. It's a good deal to save uh, all humanity in the next uh, five years. It's a good deal. The existence of poverty is really costly. It costs a great deal of money. It costs our society when people are homeless. Something like $100,000 a year just to put someone in prison. So this is really a good deal. If we can have help for the homeless, and we do have figures on this, because the PharmaCare program, for example, 
will bring down the cost of our public health care system because the the major pharmaceutical companies it's really bad if I have to ask a Radio Canada journalist to help me with the French. There's the cost of drugs and the cost of those drugs is not justified. It may only cost a few dollars for a drug, but every single day we see that that they're charging 200 or 300 dollars or a thousand dollars for a drug because the cost of those drugs is really not uh, based on the real cost. So we have to reduce the cost uh, in our health care system through a universal pharmacare program, and the numbers will be available very soon. And thank you for the question. Forgive me, please, because I have a thing about the term running for prime minister because I am um, a democracy parliamentarian nerd. Uh, no one runs to be prime minister in this country, but we've been presidentializing our system at our peril. So yes, I think I am the best qualified to be prime minister of Canada. I will say that out loud. I'll also say I don't think it's very likely. <laughs> it, I have a lot of experience. I've worked in government starting in 1986. I worked in a government when Parliament worked well, when the civil service worked better than it does today, when every department of government understood its core competency area, when scientists within government dictated policy and not the politicians, uh, well not politicians, I'd have to say again, these backroom people who never stand for office who control more of what goes on in our democracy than people who are qualified. With all of that, my goal is not, I have nothing against the NDP, I'm not running against the NDP, I'm running to elect as many of these wonderful candidates as is possible so that a caucus of Green MPs can assist can Canadians, particularly in a minority situation such as that that occurred under Lester V. Pearson. It can be said that a, a party that never held power did more to put in place our social safety net than anyone else. It was a different era then for the NDP. Back in the 1960s, Tommy Douglas didn't care who got the credit. David Lewis didn't care who got the credit. They just wanted to make our lives better. And that's the kind of people we are now. We are people who are determined to make things better for Canadians. And if a government with a prime minister that isn't green gets all the credit, if we fix things for Canadians, if we make life more affordable, and if we give our children who are now out on school climate strikes if we let them know we've got your back, we're not leaving you with this. We will not leave you with a climate emergency with galloping levels of global warming which imperil their future. So those are the things we care about. Overtaking the NDP isn't a goal. Ensuring we have good government and a strong parliament is our goal. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go to Eric. That's right. But we don't have that. And so the reality is, is that you could have a, a split of the progressive vote. It could, in many instances, like everybody here is going to earn votes, but everybody here may also lose their riding, but maybe it tips the balance and conservatives could get elected. Are you concerned about the, the splitting of progressive votes one more way in, uh, in this campaign? No. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. The strategic vote is to vote green. Absolutely. Right now, we are, for the first time, in my short career in politics, because I didn't join a political party until I was in my 50s. I, 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 I stand with the four, one of the founders of the German Green Party, who was a friend of mine, Petra Kelly, who used to describe the Greens as the anti-party party. I think partisan politics gets in our way. But set that aside, 
We have now, for the first time in my short political career, a split that is to six parties. There are six parties currently with MPs in the House of Commons. Well, the Parliament dissolved. So at the point of dissolution, six parties were represented. Six parties will return some number of MPs. The split on the right of Max Bernier and the People's Party, even if it only gets three or four percent in the popular vote, is enough to shave off differences. When you, when you really crunch down and look at the numbers, that's enough to shave off a number of conservative seats. Meanwhile, uh, we are picking up in support. We are, we are going to elect a lot more members of parliament, but we were willing to work across party lines. We don't want to make other people look bad. We want to make everybody look better. So when we get into a parliament, I think the irony of Justin Trudeau's, I mean, it's not a broken promise that 2015 will be the last election under first past the post. That, the words broken promise don't apply. Massive betrayal applies. Massive betrayal. So, so, but I think the irony, and, and there's deep irony in this, I think the parliament that gets returned after October 21st may well look like a parliament elected under fair voting. If every Canadian who has the right to vote gets out and votes, and they follow one piece of simple advice, vote for what you want. Vote for what you want and you will get a government and a parliament that requires that we do what Canadians want us to do, work together. But what we've seen more often happen uh, happens when a conservative government is elected with a majority is that there is a, a vast uh, number more who vote progressive that are sitting in the minority situation and the majority is the conservatives with 40% well, the largest, we have to always remember that the largest voting bloc in 2011 when Stephen Harper formed a majority government, if, if they had had, if they'd formed government, would have been called the We Stayed Home Party because mm -hmm. more people didn't vote than voted conservative. So I really do call on Canadians to ponder that and think about it, particularly if you're 18 and voting for the first time or you're 23 and you haven't voted yet or you're 40 and you got sick of it. Get out and vote. Whatever you would like to see happen to this country, look at the party platforms and vote for what you want. Parce que avec ça, je pense que nous, c'est presque, uh, probablement, uh, nous allons avoir un, par un parlement We minorité. will probably have uh, a minority parliament, le, le possible, and that is the most raison, likely result, but you're right. It simply isn't possible to go and vote and, and say, I want a minority government. But if every Canadian gets out and votes, and votes for what they want, and the more people who vote green, the better, because we will be much more likely then to have a parliament with people who are more committed to working across party lines to accomplish good things for Canadians than for just you know, the kind of continual punch and Judy show we now see in our question period. We don't want that anymore. We want to actually make parliament work for Canadians. So I'm not worried about that. We are going to take, we have, people say, who, where do you want to take votes from? We, Greens don't split a vote. We grow a vote. Yes. Just a little bit more on, on kind of what Simon was asking there in terms of, uh, as you just mentioned, growing the vote, but mm -hmm. obviously I don't think it's very likely that it'll be a prime minister. I mean, obviously there's been gains since 2015, uh, not only in the House, but also I mean, at different provincial levels. But in terms of that segment of the population that you want to grow that doesn't feel that there's a particular sort of relevance to the Green Party now, how how do you how do you grow that for the, a massive voting base in the GTA or the 905 who just don't see the party as relevant? How do you reach them? How are you supposed to grow that? Well, a lot of our and when I say grow the vote, it's not a slogan that's empty. When I was elected in 2011, Saanich Gulf Islands had the highest voter turnout in the country, and I defeated a sitting conservative cabinet minister. And I can tell you, for most of the campaign, what I heard was, "Why are you running here? You're going to guarantee that Gary Lund stays in power, and it's terrible because the vote will be split between the NDP, the Liberals, and the Greens, and you can't possibly win." So I heard that right up to the moment when I won. Uh, so it's it's it's. But when we won in 2011 in Saanich Gulf Islands, 75 percent voter turnout. When I was re-elected in 2015, just under 80% voter turnout. But I'm not satisfied with that. Peter Bevan Baker, the leader of the Prince Edward Island Greens, first time he was elected, he was elected with 92% voter turnout. So we don't want to see Canadians stay home anymore. And, and I don't want to be unkind because I want to work with these other leaders in Parliament later. 
But honestly, people worry about strategic voting, that they're going to have to choose the lesser of two evils. We're faced with the evil of two lessers. <laughs> So I think that helps us reach people in the GTA. How can you convince Canadians to get out and vote and mobilize? Well, I'm saying to Canadians and all Quebecers that the vote uh, with the highest level of support is uh, a fair one. Now, during the bylaw, the by-election in Nanaimo Ladysmith, there was a second Green member elected. And after that, Justin Trudeau said, well, maybe the voters are in agreement with climate change. And a week later, the two parties, the Liberals and the NDP, presented in Parliament the two motions saying that we're in a climate emergency. So I think we're in an electoral emergency, and that's why we have uh, a level of debate on this. But in my speech before Parliament, a month after the motions were presented, they adjourned the debate. And on June 17th, I made my speech calling on a non-partisan approach so that we could work together to find a solution to a, the climate emergency. But there wasn't any other leader in Parliament because it was the evening where there was uh, uh, the celebration for the Raptors' victory, and the other leaders were not in Parliament to debate that issue. All three were here in Toronto for the Raptors' victory celebration. Where does your vote make a bigger difference? With one of your traditional parties? And you have to think about it. When did you last feel really good about your vote? When did you last think that vote had a lot of power? I want to say clearly that the voters in Nanaimo Ladysmith have really clearly made a decision to do something that no one in the national media or no one in the other parties uh, thought was possible, which is to have a new Green MP uh, elected in the Nile Ladysmith, but that person won with a very wide margin of victory. So that's why I'm saying to people, think green and vote green because your vote, there's more power with a green vote than with any other vote. Now, the other parties think, oh, well, be careful, the Greens are moving forward, maybe we should be doing something about that on pharmacare, or on other things, and on the climate emergency. Uh, and not just baby steps. There is no other party out there with a real plan to eliminate the risk that we will lose our civilization because of climate change. And that's not a joke. We really have to take some difficult things and we have to do it together. She hasn't asked a question yet, so I thought it's right. You know how excited that you will be vetting for your candidate. Yes. It's a very good question. My, I have not yet spoken with him. The senior campaign management has spoken with him, and he has made a very credible case to them that he does not differ one iota from the party position that we support a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion. I haven't spoken with him yet, so you'd have to say the vetting process is not yet complete because I do want to speak with him directly. But there are other circumstances and the very, four, the very poor first response which I heard, which was I don't remember signing this petition, wasn't satisfactory to me. I just want to make one loop around and talk to him again. What was that satisfactory response? One was that he said that he filled out the petition the first time, and, and I want to double check, but he believes it was placed by the group on a second time without double checking with him. 
he, uh, there's some of it is very personal about his and his wife's situation, um, hoping to have a child. I won't get into a lot of details, but they understand totally that a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion is essential in our country. We cannot go back to the days when women died mm -hmm. because a bunch of men made a decision that we didn't control our own bodies. This is, this is not negotiable. So we just want to make sure that he's completely and he's, because he did not declare, we, one of the, our process of vetting candidates, and all these candidates have gone through it, we need to know when, when you're vetted, uh, is there anything in our policy with which you disagree? And if there is, depending on what the issue is, so we say, okay, so you don't agree with electing the Senate. Okay, fine. You're on board with climate change, you're on board with social justice, you can run. Or you don't agree with, so there's different, we, we want to know ahead of time because in our effort, which I want to state as a positive, we, I can't believe we're being beaten up for believing in democracy, but we don't think it's right that a party leader is a dictator over every single MP. And as an MP who served in the House the last eight years, I mean, a whipped vote is not an unusual occurrence. It's a daily occurrence. That's why members of Parliament don't read the legislation. Why bother? It can only make them feel miserable to vote for something they actually wouldn't want about if they want to do if they thought about it. I'm the only MP that I know who reads every bill. And I think about every bill. So I'm just going to finish and say, I have been in the House when members of Parliament have been whipped to vote against their own party policy. So I'm getting a lot of questions about, well, well, well we know what Greens stand for. We stand for our values. But when I was the only member of Parliament to vote against bombing Libya, and NDP members of parliament came up to me with their, their faces just stained with tears because they were forced to vote for something that wasn't their party policy and which was against their personal conscience. Or when conservatives came up to me, when they were whipped to vote that asbestos is safe. And these whipped votes are really uh, anti-democratic. So again, with the, with the candidate in question, I do want to make sure that when he filled out the form, he did not identify that he disagreed with the party on abortion rights. And we went back to him and said, if you disagree with us on abortion rights, why did you not declare that? He said, because I don't disagree. I support a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion. So I want to speak with him personally before I can regard the matter as closed. Well, uh, equal coverage in this election will make a very big difference if it ever happens. Yeah. Can I go back to the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sorry I, I have to apologize. I missed the fact that journalists who are accredited were also back there. I'm so sorry. I, I don't want to be the kind of politician who targets other parties. We want to advance our own ideas. I don't know the gentleman in question. I hear he has a nice reputation. He's never been in the Green Party since I've been here. But that doesn't mean he's not a good candidate. I obviously want Pierre Nantel to be reelected in Langueil Saint Hubert. But we're, we're here to talk to Canadians and give people hope that there is a party out there that doesn't do old politics, that we do things differently. And that means giving people a chance to explain themselves. It means allowing uh, for the possibility of working together later. I, I think it's really important to say, now that I've mentioned Pierre Nantel, uh, I find it appalling the way he's being attacked. He was recruited to federal politics by Jack Layton. Jack Layton trusted him. I gather Mr. Singh doesn't. But I'd also ask the new Democrats who they knew better and whose judgment they trust. Because I know that, uh, that I have no concern at all, having worked in Parliament with Pierre Nantel for eight years, that he's somehow some sort of firebrand who wants to hurt this country. He wants to ensure that all of us are addressing the climate crisis. And that election just got more interesting with Mr. Ferland in the mix in Langueil Saint Hubert.
this your shiny bottle? Is, is this going to uh, try to I love the way you put the question. And first of all, we were the first party to call for legalization of cannabis, and we don't think the Liberals got it right. Uh, we need to do a lot more work to fix the regulation of cannabis. We need to particularly address um, cannabis for health needs. It still is, it's, it's very, it's actually made some, some situations worse by bringing it in. I, I feel as though when I first read the bill to legalize cannabis, I thought, they drafted this after putting a bunch of people in a room and binge watching Reefer Madness till they then could legislate what to do with this very dangerous thing. It's very strange. So we do need to get back to that. We don't believe in shiny baubles. I, I feel as though every budget I've read for years has been like a Christmas tree with this here and that here and this will buy off the parents with kids with autism for a little bit and this will buy off the people who are really concerned about homelessness for a little bit. This will buy off those who are worried about, um, well, whatever. We, this platform represents something bold in every single category. We don't have time anymore for incremental steps. Our public broadcaster, our arts and culture sector, the dribs and drabs and tiny shiny baubles that don't actually address a crisis leave everything simmering below the surface and not resolved. So what our platform is, is a solid offer for democracy. It's not trying to buy anybody's vote. It's trying to say this is what a properly formed government and parliament would be capable of doing if we all maintained a strong sense of duty, of ethics, of hard work, and doing it together. And we can do all these things together, including protecting the rights of sex workers, including a more progressive platform than any other party on LGBTQ trans rights and two-spirited rights to make sure that programs, medications, health care, mental health supports, I haven't mentioned mental health yet this morning, mental health and addiction crisis is huge. We would decriminalize the illicit drugs on the street so that we can ensure safe supply and make sure people aren't dying, not from overdoses. The current situation, people are dying from poisonings because fentanyl is contaminating a drug supply that is illicit, is illegal, but we can't address that crisis, which is so severe that it's actually affected our life expectancy as a country. We can't address that crisis with shiny baubles. We have to actually go to the root of the problem and fix it. Yes, I'll go back here. No, the NDP did it a couple months ago. Now, it, it, getting it out there at the early stages of this campaign, are you hoping, though, that it, it sort of sets the stage and gives, puts all these ideas out there for other parties? And also, if there is one specific thing in this budget that, sort of to Jamie's question, that you want to um, become a big issue in this campaign, you talked about pharmacare earlier. Is there a specific thing that you really want to sort of take hold? Well, I, I just... I have to step back and say I was privileged this year, uh, starting in February and ending in August, to go to every province and one of our territories in 34 town hall meetings. What I heard from Canadians is reflected in this platform. So in some places in the country, they're big, and it's huge, right? If you live in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, the Maritimes, most of Canada, we've just lost our bus service, so you can't get from Prince George to Vancouver without either flying or driving because the bus service is gone. And you can't get from Saskatchewan to Regina because the bus service is gone. A lot of people in this country feel things crumbling all around them. We wanted to address that, and we did in the context of a climate emergency. Every Canadian should have access to transit. Big urban centers need much better transit systems. Rural and remote Canadians need much better transit systems. It's, a, it's an appalling scandal that we don't have transportation services the equivalent of Mexico for Canadians, right? So I don't know if there's one single thing as much as the themes. We have to take democracy back from political parties. We have to get transnational corporations out of running our governments. And we have to ensure that Canadians know that they have people who work hard for them and, and not for foreign corporations and other interests. It's much more about you know, social justice, yes, pharmacare, yes, low-income dental, child care, uh, eliminating tuition, yes, make life more affordable for our kids, take care of our seniors, do more for veterans. If anything, I guess what this platform tells Canadians, back to your question, is we're certainly not a one-issue party, unless the one issue is Canada. <laughs> Any other 
journalists that I haven't caught your eye. Don't go back, yeah. It has to be much better designed. It's hard to, hard to imagine a, a system that was worse designed. Um, one of the issues we have is that zero plastic in our society, but the regulations around cannabis require something virtually unrecyclable, a giant plastic, hard plastic canister. I, I am, by the way, unqualified to be leader of the Green Party of Canada because I have never ingested cannabis. But we were the first party to call for legalization. I stand with it. But I, visiting a friend who does ingest, I, I, I'm appalled. But they've created a system where you wouldn't think it was possible to lose money selling marijuana. <laughs> but one thing they've done is cut out the people who know how to do it because yesterday's criminals are today's experts. They're not asking them for help. They're going to a lot of former conservative cabinet members and people who used to decry cannabis to run the companies that they clearly don't know how to do this. We need more supply. And one of the ways we need more supply, because of this reefer madness uh, mindset when they drafted the legislation, was this idea that you could only grow cannabis indoors. That increases the, the, the environmental impact of the cannabis regulations at the moment is to drive up water use, to drive up electricity use, the energy drain of cannabis indoors. Anyway, they've, made, they've managed to make a system at, that only Ottawa could do, how to lose money selling grass. <laughs> uh, we need to revisit it. It should not be a burden on the provinces. It shouldn't be a burden on indigenous nations. One thing we should do is recognize that cannabis grown outdoors and organically to boost supply makes sense. We should also make sure that the ways in which cannabis is sold does not require a whole new issue of plastic pollution that we hadn't contemplated before, and to reduce the energy draw and water draw, and by the way, pesticides, because, and there is some debate about this, but growing cannabis inside greenhouses does tend to promote certain pest problems and mold problems for which they use more pesticides. So we're very conscious of the fact that this is an area that should be managed so that provinces don't have a financial hit. And we should be able to do that by, by revisiting the legislation in the next parliament. I, I applaud the Liberals for keeping that promise. Let's be clear. I may take, have a little bit of fun. But it's good to keep a promise. I wish they'd done it more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm checking for, yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Mayor, what do you think about the Prime Minister refusing to take reporters' questions the last few days on the campaign trail? Well, I think it's a shame. I think, and, and I'm sure a lot of members of my team would like it if I didn't answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to listen to the question and answer any question that's asked, and I think the Prime Minister should do so. Oh, well, his, his launch in front of Rideau Hall, I know Justin Trudeau well. And I said, why did he choose that day? Why did he look so unhappy? Why, you know, I, I, he's uncomfortable in this election campaign. Clearly, he chose four days shy of the legal minimum. A 36-day writ is the legal minimum. He may have been feeling biblical with going with 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know. <laughs> but I like to point out that does align with the great flood of Noah's Ark. And in this campaign, we are a bunch of amateurs and volunteers compared to the big party operations and their professionals. But I always like to remind people, amateurs and volunteers built the ark. Professionals built the Titanic. So, <laughs> so 